when I was invited, I was not aware that I am going to be the opening batsman in this series of seminars. So I, I face uh, the next a few deliveries with trepidation and uh, uh, tremulousness. But let's dive in straight and let's talk about frailty. And I would try and present before you an endocrine construct of frailty. Well, in this uh, presentation over the next 15 minutes, I would be introducing and defining frailty. I will talk about measures on how to recognize and measure frailty. And I will finally talk about the endocrine constructive frailty. What I will not talk about during this presentation would be endocrinal changes with aging. We will not talk about geriatric endocrinology. I will not talk in detail about the tools used to measure frailty. And I will not talk about the frailty management. The purpose of my presentation today is largely to stimulate you as an audience into thinking, to be able to design and pursue research to advance the understanding of the connects between endocrinology and frailty as we know them today. So let's introduce and define frailty as we begin and talk about this. Well, what is frailty? It's a loss of biological reserve a failure of homeostatic mechanisms, leaving an individual vulnerable to adverse outcomes. Now, if that did not leave you confused, I'm sure that the next few slides will uh, help me in confusing you further. Let's try and understand the concept a little bit by trying to draw a graph between the functional ability of an individual and the ears as the person ages. Let's say that this line here defines the state below which the person is dependent. And above this, a person is independent. So a level of functional ability, which is demarcated at this point between independence and dependence of an individual. Now let's see what happens to an individual as he struggles and deals with minor illness in a fit older person to someone who's fit and leading his life in a balance and in a homeostatic state gets a minor illness and there is a decline in functional ability. And then this individual gradually recovers, comes back to the same level of functional ability and starts to lead his life as he was leading earlier. However, the scene is entirely different in an individual who's frail. So a frail individual who suffers from a minor illness, let's say was dealing with life at a consistent homeostatic level, gets afflicted by this minor illness and there is a decline in functional ability. And during this decline, he dips below this line of dependence. And then gradually there is a recovery and he comes to a new level of homeostasis. So the key point is, that he does not achieve the same level of homeostasis, which would have been here, but he develops a new level of homeostasis and starts living his life at a lower functional ability. So that in a nutshell is describing the concept of frailty, but let's explore this concept further. So the earliest references to frailty in literature begin in 1953, go on until 1988, when Wodehouse first described frailty as a syndrome of older people with the key word that these were dependent on others for their activities of daily living and were often institutionalized. In the same year, Paulson introduced another important term, which was comorbidity into the definition of frailty. As the years went by, Gillick defined them as old, and debilitated individuals who could not survive without sustained help from others. The key words here, sustained help from others. In 1989, again, Williams defined them as individuals who require long-term care due to debilitating disease. So if you'll notice in all these definitions, we have the key concept of dependence. So it's proven that dependence is a necessary core component for the construct of frailty. But the question that remains is, 
is dependence sufficient to define frailty? Further, in recent times, the uh, precarious balance model was described by Brocklehurst, who defines frailty as uh, a state of a precarious balance between assets, which are trying to maintain health, and deficits, which threaten health. So now with this new knowledge and understanding, let's try and redefine frailty. It's a syndrome of older people with physiological and biochemical decline of multiple organ systems, leaving them vulnerable to stressors, disabled, and with comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. So frailty is also defined as the 3D syndrome, which is the three Ds of disease, disability, and dependence. And here is another way to visualize the paradigm between frailty, disease, and disability in this Venn diagrams, which intersect each other and lead to a precarious state of an older individual. Well, so much so for defining and understanding frailty. I will now talk about a little more on how to recognize and how to measure frailty in clinical practice. However, I'm not going to talk about this in detail. And there are several tools which have been used to identify frailty in clinical practice. Now, for the sake of completeness, I have listed them on this slide. And each of these is linked or hyperlinked to the particular slide which leads to this. I'm happy if Dr. Nitin shares this presentation with the audience, but I'm definitely not going to go into each of these and discuss them in detail. And suffice here to say that I will be talking about the fact that significance of frailty remains regardless of the definition that has been used to define or understand frailty and is predictive of a poor clinical outcome in terms of falls, disability, hospitalizations, and mortality, and is often associated with biological abnormalities. Having said this, let me also add that the phenotype model of frailty, which had been proposed by Linda Freed et al. from the Johns Hopkins University, well, by the way, Linda Freed is now the Dean of Mailman School of uh, uh, Public Health in New York and uh, the Columbia School of uh, Mailman School of Public Health at the Columbia University. And uh, phenotype of phenotypic model of frailty is a mixed model, which includes the subjective findings, as well as the objective measures which define frailty. And it includes the core clinical constructs of the frailty phenotype, which are weight loss, reduced strength measured by the hand grip, loss of energy, exhaustion, reduced walking speed, and decreased activity. So among these, weight loss, loss of energy, and decreased activity are self-reported, whereas reduced hand grip strength and reduced walking speed are objectively measured by the uh, trained clinician who's uh, assessing them. So I talk about this phenotype model of frailty here because this is the most commonly used uh, tool in all published literature which is used to define frailty and measure frailty for clinical studies because, with, because of the ease with which it can be applied in a clinical practice. With this, I rest my case on frailty and we will move on to the endocrine construct of frailty. While talking about the endocrine construct, there are a few key factors which play an important role in, in the development of frailty. These are the hypothalamus pituitary axis, the role of vitamin D, insulin resistance, and the unclear role of the thyroid hormones in the development. As regards the hypothalamus pituitary axis, there is aberrant regulation of glucocorticoid secretion. There is defective insulin-like growth factor signaling. There is aberrant androgen production. So let's take each of these one by one. As we said, 
the hypothalamus pituitary axis gets dysregulated, which leads to a dysregulation of glucocorticoid secretion, defective IGF signaling, and aberrant androgen production. There is a basal glucocorticoid level, which is necessary for maintaining normal function. And it has been seen that the glucocorticoid level increases with increased in stress, as many of us are already aware. Now, as there are advances in age, or as there are changes uh, with increasing age, there is a blunting of the circadian rhythm. There is a decrease in the suppression of glucocorticoid secretion, thus resulting in a continuous increased glucocorticoid level, and there is impaired recovery from stress in an individual. Now, there are some studies which have shown the association of glucocorticoid metabolism with frailty in terms of a chronic elevation of diurnal steroid level all through the day. There is, as this steroid level increases, this leads to an increased catabolism of skeletal muscles. There is a dysregulation of the hypothalamus pituitary axis feedback in frail individuals, as has been shown recently. And there is a blunted response in frail individuals to a low dose ACTH stimulation test. Talking about insulin like growth factors, these are responsible for increase in anabolic activity in cells. IGF, as you all know, is synthesized in the liver in response to growth hormone, and it regulates the expression of genes which are implicated in inflammatory regulation as well as cellular autophagy, which are two key mechanisms which are associated with frailty. Now the growth hormone secretion itself decreases at the rate of almost 14% per decade in what we term uh, leading to a state of somatopause. And this results in a decrease in lean mass and an increase in the fat mass of an individual. Now, there are some key associations with frailty which have been noted. There is an inverse correlation between IGF-1 and IL-6. The decrease in IGF-1 has been found in frail individuals, and IGF-1 has also been associated with sarcopenia, a condition which we will learn more about in the next two sessions today. Frailty has also been associated with an abnormal androgen production, and as we all know, testosterone decreases after middle age at the rate of about 2% per year. It has been shown to be associated with frailty and a low level of testosterone is often seen in frail individuals. Testosterone supplementation has been shown to increase muscle mass and strength. However, trials have been terminated because of the adverse cardiovascular events which have been noted with the supplements in the in the uh, experimental groups. Now, low levels of uh, dehydroepinandrosterone has uh, been also associated with increased incidence of frailty over a period of 10 years. A high cortisol to dehydroepinandrosterone ratios have also been associated with increased incidence of frailty in 10 years in follow-up studies. But it is yet unclear whether DHEA supplementation is helpful in prevention of frailty. Although we recommend the role of vitamin D supplements uh, for preventing osteoporotic fractures, a recent uh, pooled meta-analysis which included 33 randomized control trials and was published in JAMA recently showed there is no reduction in risk. Vitamin D has been found to have associations with frailty in terms that a decrease in vitamin D is associated with all four components of frailty. A decrease in vitamin D has also resulted in an in increased incidence in frailty in prospective studies and a vitamin D supplementation in the range of 800 to 1000 units is consistent with an increase in strength and balance. Similarly, there has been association between insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, where components of metabolic syndrome are associated with frailty, largely due to central obesity, and a clustering of metabolic syndrome, frailty, and mortality has been noted. 
we will be listening more about sarcopenic obesity in the subsequent lectures. And I will, uh, in this last slide, talk about the thyroid hormones, the role of which remains largely unclear. And there have been some associations, but these remain doubtful. In my final uh, two minutes, I would like to summarize the take home messages for today and try and uh, bring to you a visual conceptualization of the endocrine construct of frailty. We have genetic factors and environmental factors which always have an interplay among themselves and which continually lead to accumulative cellular damage in the human body. This results in an impaired hypothalamus pituitary axis. There is damage to hippocampal neurons that happens with age and is associated with diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And there is also an ongoing inflammation in the body, both of which again lead to an impaired hypothalamus pituitary axis. Now this affects in turn the three organs of the liver, testes and the adrenals. The adrenals, as we saw, lead to a chronic increase in glucocorticoid circulations, which leads to muscle breakdown, and as a result causes sarcopenia. The impact of the impaired hypothalamus pituitary axis on the adrenals is also a decline in the DHEAS levels, which leads to decline in muscle protein synthesis at the same time. The testes also reduced function and decline in testosterone reduces muscle protein synthesis. And the liver, which is now producing lesser and lesser insulin-like growth factors, also contributes to the dec decline in the muscle protein synthesis, all of which goes on to add to sarcopenia. At the same time, the chronically low vitamin D levels and insulin resistance also contribute to sarcopenia as well as directly to frailty. And once the frailty sets in, it has been shown to have impaired mobility, falls, disability, and poor outcome. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your patient attention. And I will hand over to the organizers here.